is occurring. The data I'm going to be presenting is, uh, usually I just claim all the credit for myself, but a lot of my colleagues here today, Dr. Eric Brown actually was one of the first people who set up many of the monitoring sites we'll be talking about, and uh, kind of got me out there and got me going, and taught me his meticulous ways of monitoring coral reefs. Um, Bill Walsh. Dr. Walsh was very uh, instrumental in getting us started on Maui, making sure we got an old, beat up 17 foot whaler shipped over to Maui and getting us out there in the water. So we appreciate that. And then I, or Dr. Dr. Um, Williams, <coughs> has been indispensable in helping gather the data, criticizing us, letting us know when we uh, estimated the size of a fish at about five times more than its maximum size, <coughs> or something to that effect. So all of these folks have been very critical in, in helping us gather this data together. And uh, I'm just going to kind of zip right through it because I'm not giving them much time at all. In fact, I'm wasting some of it now. So the slippery slope to slime, this process where a healthy, actively growing um, coral reef habitat degrades, and in some cases quite quickly, to a algae-dominated, eroding, flat plain that doesn't support much life even if um, you protected it, the fish don't really have homes to, to hang out in anymore. <clears throat> so what's driving this slippery slope to slime around Maui as, as well as elsewhere in the world? This comic strip that actually appeared in the Maui News kind of outlines it. Kid walks into the aquarium store. He asks, how do I create a realistic marine environment? And the guy says, well, you need agricultural runoff, coastal overdevelopment, unprocessed sewage, and depleted fish species. I threw in a few extras there. Nutrification, alien species, things of that sort. These are the things I'm going to talk about throughout this um, presentation here. But the real point is there's plenty of blame to go around. And I try to try to hamper on this because we go out and we start talking about restricting fishing. Fishermen say we blame them for everything. We start talking about uh, sewage injection wells and uh, nutrients from fertilizers and ag fields or or landscaping, then everybody else thinks we're blaming them. But whenever you point your finger anywhere, there's three fingers pointing back. Really, the, the root cause is us, all of us. People, population, and all of the impacts we're exerting on our nearshore environment. So, to measure what's happening in the reef, we're looking at coral cover. The percent of the bottom covered with living coral tissue. And these graphs here all show this over, in some cases, a uh, data set that goes back to the early 90s. 1994, um, and some of them, the data set starts in the late 90s, like 98 or 99. Uh, it's, it's listed with the red graphs showing significant declines, 
the black ones staying significantly the same, and the green ones showing significant increases. Just looking at the color scheme there, you see that most of them are not doing so good. Uh, we do have one slide that's showing significant gains. I'm not going to talk about that because I'm going to stay on the death and destruction theme here. <laughs> Actually, uh, anybody involved with the forestry knowledge program, that is one of your uh, benefits there. That's a very heavily used area and it's showing very clear increases. It's Conahanna Bay, often called Ahi'i Bay in the NARS. Uh, Conahanna Point showed significant decreases fairly recently, a fairly substantial decrease. That's all most likely a result of crown of thorns predation. So we're not going to talk about that. And then all the way on the top, I like the pointed things, but top of uh, Honolulu Bay has shown really substantial downward turn and consistent over the time frame of the data set. And that one, you know, it depends on who you talk to. You can, you can corner Dr. Brown later on and, and try and uh, get his opinion on it. He did, I think, a long drawn out PhD dissertation on that very topic. Uh, but most likely some impact of episodic sediment events, flushing a lot of dirt onto the reef, and low or poor recruitment of new recruits into the area. <clears throat> what I do want to talk about is these three sites that are showing very substantial decreases. The Papaula Point and the North Shore, although black, has shown over the last three or four years a very substantial decrease. And all of these sites are coinciding with increases in alien invasive seaweed growth. Let's just look at uh, data with some of our data as well as UH Botany's in terms of where invasive algae are most present on the island. And I want to point out the large red circles because those are the sites with 30% or more invasive algae growth. Now to be fair, the entire central isthmus of Maui is an agricultural area. So there's a lot of nutrient input from ag, I'm sure. The areas where these are showing up are also very urbanized areas. So there's also a lot of potential for fertilizers on coastal areas and other non-point uh, source pollution. But it's also interesting when you look at where sewage injection wells are and the fairly substantial volume and nutrient-rich water that is put into the ground at these locations. And these are what? the waters look like on the outer reefs at all of those sites. So the algae growth is fairly substantial. And primarily the biggest problem we have on the outer reefs is the seaweed acanthophora, often commonly called prickly seaweed. First got into the state in uh, 1952, I believe on a barge, military barge in the Pearl Harbor. By 1961 it was reported on all major islands Yet, for some reason, wasn't much of a problem. Stayed confined to the shallow subtidal areas. Wasn't openly growing out on the reefs. That all has changed over the last five years or so. Just to give you some sense on what a healthy versus degraded reefs from Maui are looking like, here's Molokini. And Molokini is obviously out in the middle of a channel. It is protected, so it has healthy fish stocks. There's about 80 to 90% coral cover, and it has remained unchanged when we look at percent coral cover. And of course, it's not going to work. See, I'm a Macintosh person. I'm blame the PC people for this. <laughs> but we'll try to move on anyway. Maybe we can't even do that. OK, so. If the video was working, which is really cool, I promise you, you would start from what it looked like in 2000, move through to 2004. In 2004, you can see that some of the corals, the Pasilopora, cauliflower coral at the bottom, have gotten much larger, and the, the plate coral, the Montipra, has grown out and up quite a bit. So even though the percent coral cover has stayed about the same, the change in the reef is substantial. It is continually growing out and up, and you know, when you look at it over that course of time frame, it, it's quite obvious. <clears throat> a stress coral reef, one that we're trying to spend a little more time looking at, and one that I hope to have time if I don't get cut off, described in a little more detail is the Kahikili, or the North Kanapali area. And this site, we're looking at about 55% coral cover, down to 33% from the early 90s till present up to 35% invasive algae growth. It tends to be seasonal. It blooms in the summer, kind of goes away in the early fall. And let's see if it works here. 
And of course it doesn't. Uh, you just have to take my word for it, it is neat. PCs. Don't get me started. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so, Kai Keeley Park, again, if you look at the top, 1999, you can see it wasn't the healthiest place then either. Right off the bat in 2001, we had this bad um, seasonal bloom of Clodophora seaweed that came in. So we took two data sets during 2001. Then it kind of went away. 2002 wasn't too bad. By 2003, we had the Acanthophora filling in. And it was variable depending on what time of the year we were serving. 2005 was pretty bad again. 2006, there wasn't much, but we did the survey in December. So most of it had, had left or been ripped off by surf. But what I want you to notice is the difference between 1999 and 2006 in the health of the reef. You can see it's become a lot more patchy. The large lobata heads up on the top corner have become a lot more fractioned and small. And that's kind of corresponds very clearly with what the data is showing with almost a 50% decrease in coral cover over the last 12 years. Malaya Bay is our poster child on what we do not want to see happen. Uh, our two survey sites are shown just off the reef jetty there. I want to just throw in a couple quotes uh, to give some perspective. Dr. Kinsey in 72 did an assessment of the general area of Malaya Bay and um, he described the coral as striking in their diversity and the presence of rare coral species. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service did an assessment in the early 90s for uh, part of an environmental assessment to expand the harbor. And uh, they described the coral cover at somewhere around 50 to 75 percent. Okay. Growing up in Maui, this is an area I used to go spear fish as well. It was a very healthy coral reef area. There's a lot of fish out there. This is what it looks like today. Okay. And so again, if you're looking from the early 90s, you're looking at maybe somewhere around 75 percent coral cover. Today, you're around 4 percent and at times as much as 77% of the bottom covered with this invasive algae. So here's a complete swap from 75% coral to 77% algae. Not a good thing. And as you can, you can see clearly that the cracks and crevices in the holes that the fish would live in have been grown over and filled up. So theoretically, even if you were to protect this area, there wouldn't be any fish there to protect. There's no home for them. Even if you dumped a bunch of manini out there, they'd probably all swim away or be eaten. So, this is a, the, the, the level of degradation we do not want to see happen. And we want to try to see if we can intervene on reefs like Kayakiri before you get to this point. And there again, there's that awesome video. Glad you guys all liked it. Let's move on here. Okay, um, and again, so here's, you know, in 1999, we had to look hard to find a coral head. But here's one kind of hanging in there. And by 2005, you can see how much of it had died away and been overgrown by the, the Aiken Tafra. So, what are we looking as something we can do about it? There's two main factors driving this, okay? And this isn't brain surgery, but there's natural controls on a reef such as grazing, herbivores, you know, the cows and horses in the pasture. So here's some fish doing what they should do in the reef. They're on uh, manini and they're grazing the acanthafa. The other side to it is obviously nutrients that are fueling some of the growth, okay? The fertilizer you put in your garden. Because we didn't have enough time to really get into this, I'm leaving out the nutrients for the most part, but I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about grazers and how we can maybe look at better managing these fish, not so much for their sake, but for the sake of their role on the reef. So some of the evidence that suggests we may have a better, um, have a chance of actually controlling the ink and phosphor and, and helping protect these reefs comes from some work done by UH Botany folks and put in a paper by Cindy Hunter in which they looked at feeding preferences of various types of seaweed with several different types of herbivore fish. And acanthophora in the red is preferred by two to one over the next closest seaweed, which is hypnia mesoformis. So from my point of view, our two problematic seaweeds fish like to eat. That's good. Okay, that gives us a chance if we can up the grazing pressure on the reef. The other thing comes from the study that um, Eric was talking about earlier, the fish habitat utilization work, where they surveyed open areas and marine reserves throughout the state, and then they looked at a graph that related the uh, biomass of herbivores on the reef. So as you get further along to the right, you have more herbivore grazing fish versus the amount of macroalgae on the reef as you go higher up. So obviously, 
what you see with that line is that you have more grazing biomass, you have less algae or lemur on the reef. What's also important here is that the red squares are reserves. So the sites that are higher with herbivore biomass are in fact also ones where fishing is not allowed or fishing is restricted in some way. So this suggests that we can actually raise herbivore biomass on a reef by restricting fishing for these grazers. <clears throat> I realize many of you may not have had the opportunity to see grazing herbivore fish in a very natural, healthy state in a reef. So this is what it looks like when you have a nice big school of manini swimming around. I had a video for this too, but I knew it wasn't going to work. So. Um, and this is what they do. They graze. Okay, so you can think of this analogous to um, mowing your lawn. Here's this big school of 500 manini, and they're mowing a swath right through the algae. And then they turn around and they come the other way. And back and forth, and they're doing it all day long. So if you are lean or seaweed, you don't stand much of a chance against that kind of intense grazing pressure. And this effectively is an important control mechanism when the habitat is opened up and the nutrients are there for the seaweed to grow, a healthy supply of herbivores will keep it in check and or keep it completely non-existent. This is just some basic work we did around Mali. The red sites are reserves, the green sites are control sites. We're doing fish surveys. The size of the spot indicates how much manini are there in terms of abundance. The big circles, therefore, generally represent these large schools, healthy schools of manini. You can see that in Honolulu Bay in the top right, there's a couple good looking spots there. On Lanai, in Manelli, in Hulapoi, there's some good looking spots. Uh, the other only open access area that we see these large schools of manini is a kind of a remote area along the Lanai um, coastline. So even though it's an open access area, it's hard to get to. It doesn't get much fishing pressure. And then we see some medium-sized spots in the Hii Canal as well as Molokini. But all the other open access areas around Mali, we don't see these schools of Manini, these large schools. This is just looking at the biomass. And the main point I want to make here, especially since I'm almost out of time, is that the bulk of the biomass is herbivores, the green portion of the bar. So when there's any reduction in the fish, five minutes? Oh, well, by any time. We'll just get started, and I'll leave it back now. Um, so the, the green bars are the herbivores, and so any reduction in the biomass on your, your reef is a substantially bigger reduction in primary consumers are the herbivores than any of the other things. And then if you look at, I guess, the, you know, the, all the way on the left side is the open areas generally, like Makana, Kiavikapu, Kapalua, and La Perouse Bay. You can see that the green bars in those areas are compared to a, a remote area that has high biomass like Lanai Lighthouse are just a fraction of what it is over there. So we don't have really good data at each site to show that the biomass of herbivores have decreased, but we can make these kind of broad comparisons and say it looks like the, the biomass of herbivores in these areas is substantially less than it could be compared to other areas that show much higher. So how do we increase the herbivore numbers? The leg on that rule may be one important step in that direction in that a lot of these types of herbivores are harvested with lay nets, lay gill nets. If you think about a large school of manini, you lay out a net, you can pipe by or chase the whole thing into the net. Okay, if you go out there with a spear, you're probably only going to get 10, 15 of them trying for quite a while. So hopefully if we can get good compliance with that rule, at least in concept, then we'll see around the island of Maui an increase in our herbivore numbers. But the other thing we're looking at is the possibility of a marine managed area to accomplish this. And that leads to what we're calling, conceptually anyway, our Kahikili, or North Kanapali, herbivore enhancement area. The idea here is a marine managed area designed to protect and enhance the herbivore fish and invertebrates. We're looking at the three main families that we consider critical in grazing macroalgae. The surgeon fish, manini, kala, things like that, palai. The uh, menui, or the rudder fish, and then the parrotfish, the uhu. These three main families are critical in controlling this macroalgae on the reef, as well as all of the urchins. Um, the study would look to see that if you increase these herbivore stocks, can they effectively reduce the invasive algae problem, and as such, improve the coral reef health. 
The other thing uh, that we're looking here is to have rules that prohibit fish feeding, because it's kind of counterproductive. If you're protecting these fish so they eat the limu or the seaweed, and then the turtles go out there and fill them up with peas. So along that lines, it's kind of just promoting a conservation ethic, not just with the fishermen who are going to sacrifice and not go out and harvest these fish from this area, but also with the tourists who um, utilize this area so that they're not feeding the fish. We're going to be doing things like monitoring the coral and algae. It's already a study site. We already have many years of data there, as I showed you. Monitor the fish and invertebrate abundance and biomass. Attempt to determine which species are most critical. This is an important concept here as well, in that certainly certain types of fish and urchins and things play a more critical role than others. And it's important for us to kind of get a grip on that so we can better protect resources statewide with that information. And then use this information gathered, as I just said, to better protect coral reefs all over the state. Here's the site. Why are we thinking about this site? Many of you are familiar with Maui, the Kanapali area, would know this lower part is the general Kanapali Resort. Black Rock, or Kekaha Point, is uh, where the Sheraton Resort is. And if you go further north, all the way up to Honokawai Park, this would be the actual zone that we're talking about. Um, the coral reef there is actually quite nice. There's a lot of habitat. And it is uh, impacted with this seasonal growth of algae, like I mentioned. But it's still kind of hanging in there and has the potential to come back fairly quickly with some protection. The prominent point being black rock and to try and get into that fish feeding thing that occurs a lot in black rock, we wanted to extend it all the way to the beach there, encompass the area by the Sheraton where people often feed fish. Go all the way down to Home Kauai Park because that encompasses most of the nice reef around the point as well. Um, and then basically would enclose that entire functional reef there. As you get further north, it just becomes kind of uncolonized pavement without much coral. Another thing to point out would be the sewage treatment plant outlined in yellow, where they inject approximately 3 million gallons to 3.5 million gallons a day of treated wastewater fluid, looking at somewhere around 200 pounds of nitrogen, pure nitrogen that goes into the ground there every day as part of that. So one of the efforts we want to do is draw attention to that and help encourage better reuse of the water. The county does a great job of treating their water. Most of it's tertiary treated, unrestricted for agricultural uh, irrigation, yet much of it is not being used. Okay, so the Aiken phosphorus is what grows there and fish like to eat it. There's abundant nutrients as I just mentioned. So one interesting thing about this from a scientific point of view is, what is that, zero or two? Zero? So you're not, not, no, you're going to have to drag me off of there. Real quick is that the nutrients will fuel the algae, and if we can up the uh, herbivore numbers, maybe we can see if, if how, how critical they are in relation to nutrients. And then probably more important is there's still a fair amount of fish there. They're fairly healthy fish assemblages. A little bit of protection, we would fully expect that they would come back. Okay, look into the future. This is my little propaganda here. Support our efforts. Okay, be aware of what we're doing. You're doing that right here by being at this conference. But, um, you know, help educate others and help us through the, the public hearing process get this initiated. Help us ensure compliance with our rules such as the LANET ban. Okay, enforcement needs your help. So call it in when you see illegal activities. And the last two have to do with the nutrients, but just responsible land stewards, reducing our nutrient use and supporting full reuse of wastewater would be critical for that. And that would be it. Oh, <laughs> Hakala la ke ki amanu ika ohu ika ohi ahamau me ho ahamau itale o kale hua pane apane mai pahai ke ya mamue.